So welcome, welcome everyone to this uh, launch of our latest book, uh, Building Resilient Organizations. I'm uh, Tairo Hassan, uh, the director of Brightline at uh, the Project Management uh, Institute, PMI. We are really thrilled today to have collaborated uh, with Thinker Strictly on our sixth book, starting with Strategy at Work that we released in 2017. And then we move on to the Chief Strategy Officer and uh, the Transformation Playbook, uh, Transformation Beyond the Crisis. The one from last year was Perpetual Transformation. And this year we have Building Resilient Organizations. Uh, we are really thankful to all authors who generously contributed and share their insights there. Without them, this book won't be. And we also want to say big thank you, of course, uh, to the amazing team who worked tirelessly on making the book reality. And uh, as you'll see over the coming months and years, we'll seek opportunities to have many authors joining us in interactive sessions like the one today. And uh, as noted in the foreword by uh, Pierre Lemon, uh, our president and CEO at the Project Management Institute, quote, uh, in the ever evolving world of work, Understanding and achieving resilience has never been more important. We hope that building resilient organizations will enable you to embed transformation and resilience in your organization, end of quote. So for today's session, I'm really pleased to welcome Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers 50, who will moderate the session with a lineup of four distinguished speakers, experts, executives, and book contributors. Uh, Stuart, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you to Brightline for working with Thinkers50 over the last few years. Um, we're really delighted to have finished the, the sixth book in the series, Building Resilient Organizations. And thank you, first of all, to everybody to, for joining us today from throughout the world. It just shows you what a a riveting and important subject, resilience is, and how multifaceted it is. Uh, I think that will be really brought, brought to the fore today in our discussion, because we have four of the contributors to the book, and there are 21 contributors to the book, so thank, thank you to all of those, and I see some of them have joined this session as well. Um, so we have four great contributors to the book joining us today, and our emphasis will be on practical application of their ideas. How can you really make resilience a reality in your organization? So today we are joined by Chris Clearfield. Chris is the co-author of Meltdown. Uh, his uh, contribution to the book was entitled Building Resilience by Leading Change. So welcome to Chris. Uh, we are joined by Gudrun Johns Dottier, who's the Chief Strategy Officer of Reykjavik Energy. Uh, Gudrun's fantastic contribution to the book focused on organizations as resilient living systems. We are joined by Susie Kennedy from the UK, who's a leadership coach, founder of KBA Solutions, an expert on change leadership and leadership development. Uh, her contribution to the book was entitled Resilient Leadership. And finally, but not least, we have Karsten Linz. Uh, Karsten is the founder and CEO of Blue Gain and the author of Radical Business Model Transformation. Karsten's contribution to the book was about why learning organizations are resilient. So what I'm going to do now is go to each of the four uh, contributors today to just get their basic take on on resilience what it means to them so first of all let's do it in alphabetical order and let's go to chris clearfield chris is the the co-author as i said of meltdown which a really excellent book uh winner of the thinkers 50 strategy award in uh, 2017 uh or is it 2019 i think it was I, I, 2019 i think because it was I, I, it was <laughs> Sorry, Chris, I have lost track of time. There's a, br there's, a, there's, a, there's a brilliant quote at the start of your contribution to the book. You say, resiliency is the ability to change course in response to pressure and potential catastrophe. It's not a single strategy, but a shift in attitude and capabilities. It requires a willingness to change even in the face of great success. I mean, it seems you, you're saying it's, it, it's multifaceted, but it's actually working against human nature. And human nature is 
not to do when you're successful, not to do a great deal more. <clears throat> right. And I think when you're successful, it's to recognize that um, whatever you're doing right now contributes to your success. So whatever, whatever strategy you're doing right now has worked to get you to this moment in time. And so I think for me, there's kind of two, two implications of that. I mean, one is that paradoxically, we, we get to start change by actually appreciating, even if we want to go in a new direction, appreciating so deeply just what is now and, and the value that that provides for us because it's you know gotten us to, to where we are. Um, but then the flip side of that, of course, is that you know even though we've survived to this moment, that's not a guarantee that as conditions change, as crises happen, as the world changes, um, it's not a guarantee that that we're well set up for the next step and the next moment. And so to me, that's where you know resilience as a a, a spectrum of things that comes into play with really change change at the center of it, as you said. You, there's a line you you use you, you talk about moving from solving technical problems to solving socio-technical problems. Can can you unpack that for me? Yeah. So you know, I think a lot of leaders, a lot of leaders that I work with, and I tend to work with people in, in more technical, you know, finance, engineering, um, uh, even safety, um, law. So th these are folks that have a deep technical expertise in their field. But then as, as you get promoted in your leadership journey, the problems you have to solve, they're, they're no longer technical problems. I mean, they might have a technical element of them or a technical component of them, but, but really they are problems that are kind of, you know, people, process, and technology. And so if you're in a situation where you would like to lead, you know, create a meaningful change in your organization or even in your team, changing to doing things in a different way that is supportive of the new environment that you're in, you really have to start by letting go of some of those tools of expertise and problem solving in order to be able to actually have the impact and to influence stakeholders beyond the kind of, you know, the narrow sphere of what, of what you ultimately control, which, you know, your ability to control people can get compliance, but but that sort of decays very quickly in, in space and time. So you've really got to learn to lead people on a journey and, and think of yourself more as a guide than as somebody who's providing solutions. You talk, you talk about creating possibilities rather, rather than imposing answers. Yes, because the, the, look, the problems, the problems that are left are all complex problems, right? And this is kind of what we, what we, where we start meltdown um, with. But the problems that are left are complex problems. They're not problems that have easy answers. And so if you show up with your kind of, you know, your, your hammer and your answer tool belt, then you're just going to keep reproducing the same conditions that lead to whatever challenge you're, you're facing now. And so I think that, you know, the, the age of the kind of monolithic solution where leaders at the top of an organization come up with a plan, come up with a strategy and, and push it out, I think those days are really... They're, they're numbered, if not over. Um, and so the, I think the opportunity, again, is to think, okay, well, what do we want to try so we can go out and try things at a scale that's appropriate, knowing that we're going to fail, but knowing that our goal is really to learn something and to use that learning as, you know, information to take, to, to inform the next step in our, in our journey. In, in, in your article in the book, you, you mention the British poet John Keats, the romantic poet, and his notion of negative capability. Yeah. Can, can you tell me how John Keats' negative capability applies to the 21st century organization? Right. It's not an obvious connection, is it? Um, uh, but it, it's, it's really the ability to... I mean, so so Keats is brilliant, right? And Keats talks about it in the sense of the ability to sit with the discomfort of not knowing in order to let things emerge, basically. And Keats's argument is that this is what Shakespeare did so brilliantly. This is what, you know, the kind of brilliant, as I, I think he puts it, brilliant men of letters uh, do. They're able to be with the problem and sit with it and and feel it and be with the discomfort of it without immediately having to kind of 
break the symmetry and get to an answer. And I think that, you know, we spend our whole, I mean, certainly our whole schooling, our whole careers, most of our careers and our schooling being, you know, okay, here's a well-packaged problem. Now come up with an answer and sort of produce that answer, right? And we get rewarded when we get that answer right. So that habit is very, very strong in us. But again, if, if, if you, you believe that the problems of today are kind of beyond the ken of any single person to answer, then a lot of what we have to do is sit with the discomfort of not knowing the answer and sort of as leaders hold ourselves back as our, as our teams, as we shepherd everybody through the process of discovery and experimentation. And so, so much of what we do, and I know some of the other uh, folks we have on the panel today have, have uh, written about this and, and, and think about this, but so much of, I think, what's important to being resilient and to leading change is the ability to manage your own discomfort and the ability to manage your own reactivity. Um, and, and, and because if, you're, if you show up with your reactivity, then that gets in the way of building relationships and influencing people and finding out what, what's up for others and being curious about others' experiences. And so it's kind of, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, remarkably important, but also um, something that, that we don't necessarily spend a lot of time on uh, as leaders. We don't necessarily spend a lot of time kind of building our, our you know, we, a lot of us self-manage very well, but, but we do that sometimes by suppressing our feelings rather than being able to be with them and to be with that discomfort. So it's the relationship between personal and organizational resilience it, it is really interesting. Yeah. Because I think the, the assumption, uh, and my assumption, I think the association of resilience has been in, in the business sphere has been about organizations rather than individual resilience. Right. And I think, um, yeah, I... I... And also, I think some of the way we talk about resiliency in, in an organizational sense is, you know, the ability to, I don't know, withstand a shock, withstand a disruption to bounce back. And, and that is certainly part of it. But I think <clears throat> there's a kind of a, a foundational element that is just, you know, even as an organization, being able to admit to people that you don't know the answer, being able to admit, you know, to have a senior leader come out and say, we're going to, you know, we're going to try this, but we don't know if it's going to work. I mean, that's a very, that's a very powerful stance if it's also married with the ability to um, get input from people and co-create and, and create psychological safety and, you know, all of these kind of fundamental things that are part of, of create the work of creative problem solving. Um, but, but it also really starts with that, our ability to manage ourselves as, as leaders and to not, not jump to conclusions and not kind of push on, you know, just push on answers. Chris, thank you, thank you. We'll, we'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, just a reminder, please send in your questions. I need to see the questions are starting to come in. Uh, we'll come, we'll come round. I'll come round to those uh, shortly. Uh, but next, I'd like to introduce um, Goodrun John Stontier, who's the Chief Strategy Officer of Reykjavik Energy in Iceland. Uh, she's also just about to finish a PhD on ownership strategy. Uh, and Gudrun's got some, uh, a couple of sh slides to share with us to, get, to give her take on, on, on uh, resilience. Gudrun, over to you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, like you mentioned, I am a Chief Strategy Officer at Reykjavik Energy. Uh, and I'm also a chairwoman for Vader Utilities, which is the largest utility company in Iceland. And with my experience, uh, it comes that I have strong opinions on how a clear vision and a strategy can create resilience. Uh, if you take a look at the next slide, uh, I'm very fond of uh, I'm very fond of this because in the Chinese language, the word crisis is composed of those two characters and where one represents danger and the other opportunity. But in order to turn a threat into an opportunity, organizations need resilience. Um, uh, I actually, uh, I have defined or uh, read about uh, resilience as being the ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. But I think that thinking about it in this way, it implies uh, reactive thinking. 
And it is my belief that organizations must put focus on constantly adapting through resilience and being proactive. So that means to constantly challenge the equilibrium because no challenges, that means stagnation and it can contribute to the decline of innovative ideas. But this, of course, it requires a culture that embraces challenges uh, and uh, strong leadership is required to implement the thinking and the behavior to perceive crisis as an opportunity. And if we take a look at the next slide, it's just a beautiful picture <laughs> that we have from Reykjavik Energy. So the focus at Reykjavik Energy, it has been on applying governance to support the strategy execution management. Uh, and the process that we have implemented, and we've named it strategic corporate governance, it, it entails continuous revision of strategy policies, our objectives and goals. So it entails appointing a one person responsible for each policy that is in effect within Reykjavik Energy. And this person is responsible for abiding to a yearly revision plan revising the policy, its objectives and goals, while being also accountable for the outcome. And this, is, uh, this party meets with the board of directors yearly to go through the revision and it rests with the, with the board, of course, uh, to confirm the, re the revision. But with this focus on corporate strategic management, the organization is able to respond quickly to changes in the external as well as the internal environment through its strategies and policies. And therefore uh, to adapt the strategy execution plan towards the vision of the organization. And this has made Reykjavik energy adaptable and flexible. So responding quickly to change and challenges. And this has indeed, uh, this has indeed contributed to the resilience of the company. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Gudrun. Uh, we think it seems to me what what you're doing at Reykjavik Energy is kind of a, trying to achieve a balance between flexibility and control. And and, and gov governance is normally seen as all about control, but what you're creating is kind of dynamic governance. Yes, definitely. Is that a, is that a fair understanding? It is a fair understanding, and, and I think that, of course, flexibility is really important, but with some degree of control. But the flexibility is very important. And like I said, uh, the disruption of uh, the equilibrium, because we are going to be stagnant if we don't, uh, if we don't embrace uh, challenges. I mean, historically, resilience has been associated with equilibrium. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I've already said that there is a human desire for equilibrium. Yes. Which makes you, you, your, your approach difficult. Yes, that's true. It makes it uh, difficult. But that means, of course, that you have to work with the culture of the company. That's really important. And you need uh, leadership uh, that, like Chris said, is uh, able to uh, say that they don't know the answer. And uh, that is able to uh, get all of the employees with him as a leader uh, in order to create you know, new ideas, uh, embracing those challenges, and it's a cultural change. Uh, and what, what stage are you at with the strategic corporate governance? Mm. Where, where, where is it in its evolution? Uh, I would say that we are, um, we are at the point of uh, challenging the equilibrium. We are at the point of challenging stagnation. Uh, and we are uh, at the point that we are disrupting, uh, like I said, uh, the equilibrium and constantly trying to do that through this uh, strategic corporate governance. We are constantly uh, challenging what we are doing and where we are going. D does that make um, Reykjavik Energy an uncomfortable place to work? <laughs> That's a great question, but no, I wouldn't say so because we have a very strong leadership uh, at Reykjavik Energy and we have a very strong leader that does in fact, uh, uh, does in fact say that he doesn't really know the answer. 
uh, but he gets uh, the people uh, around him uh, working with him on finding the solutions. So he is able to admit that he's wrong and he doesn't know the answer. So that's a very strong leadership in my opinion. Yeah, so it's leadership built around creating uh, long-term resilience, but willing to um, upset the apple cart and disturb the equilibrium along the way. Yes. And, and and you're an expert on ownership strategy, and I know the ownership of Reykjavik Energy is. I mean, there's there's, there's a variety. Of, there's three different owners. How how does that complicate things? Uh, actually, it uh, makes things easier. <laughs> if you're intent on uh, implementing an ownership strategy, uh, it, it has actually helped us with. Uh, the governance part, because we have to abide uh, to the rules or the vision of the ownership strategy. And with, uh, with the implementation comes this strong long-term focus, but uh, with the processes uh, that are accompany the implementation of the ownership strategy, uh, the process of uh, constantly uh, challenging all of those strategies, but always within the long-term vision and the corporate governance that comes uh, from the ownership strategy. Thank you, Gudrun. It's always good to get a um, practitioner's viewpoint of these issues because it can be, I mean, resilience is a, is a theoretical issue. So it's, it's really good getting, get, getting your view. So thank you, Gudrun. Uh, thank you. Our next contributor is Susie Kennedy. Uh, Susie is a, a leadership coach, founder of KBA Solutions, expert on change leadership and leadership development, and her contribution to the book is about resilience leadership. Uh, well, welcome, Susie. Um, so resilience, I mean, you argue that resilience is a strength that leaders can develop. Indeed, Stuart. In fact, my piece is really all about the very practical side, or if you like, the behavioural side of, of building resilience. Um, and so when I talk about resilient leadership, uh, by that I mean the ability to develop one's own resilience, to prepare for future crisis, and to help teams thrive in these challenging conditions. Um, and so uh, our approach in terms of putting together the, the piece was to draw on the research which we've been conducting for the whole of the COVID period uh, in UK local government senior managers to establish how they had dealt with with, um, with, with, uh, with the crisis. And also to take lessons from professional backcountry ski guide and author Rob Coppolillo on how in, in leading in high uncertain, high consequence environments, how they uh, build resilience for crisis. Well, let's, let's, let's take those in order. Talk about it, well, let's, let's talk about the ski guide manual. So, so it's a ski guide manual, I mean, basically you're, you're taking, interpreting it as a kind of a guide to, uh, to resilience? Well, actually, what was very interesting, it all happened kind of by mistake, falling over the ski guide manual, but what, what, what amazed me was when I uh, looked at the early chapters, the actual reason why I was interested in this was because uh, Rob Coppolello had uh, quoted Amy Edmondson and the importance of psychological safety uh, among teams, uh, Kahneman for decision-making. So there was a real connection, if you like, between our world and business and uh, you know th th this guy that takes people uh, up mountains and sees them down the other side. Um, but what was particularly important from, from a resilience point of view, of course, their preparation is absolutely critical because it can be a life or death situation, notwithstanding the fact that it's rec recreational. Um, but they have a, a particular risk management framework that they use for preparation. And it was really when I, when, when I read through the preparation and the thought processes, I thought, well, this is exactly what our own leaders will be doing and should be doing in preparation uh, for the next crisis in order to build that resilience. Yeah, I thought it was, it's, it's worth quoting what the, 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 uh, the advice was. So it was stay fit and healthy, track the season's conditions, practice rescue, learn about avalanches, become an expert navigator, investigate route options, find compatible partners and get your gear ready. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I quite like get, get your gear ready as a, advice to all organisations. Oh, well, actually, but very interesting. Uh, what he goes on to say a little bit later on uh, is that 
you know, we're, we often spend more time selecting our new pair of skis than we do building, focusing on the skill that we need to be able to keep ourselves alive. And, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a more interesting thing to do. So I, I thought those lessons were, were particularly, particularly important. I mean, there, there, there are a number of little gems there as well. Um, he tells a story about one of the guides, a guy called Tom Murphy, who says, it, it, by way of building psychological safety within the group, they have this kind of rule, which is everyone has a voice, everyone has a veto, uh, which means basically if somebody at the back calls it when they're halfway up a mountain, they have to actually agree that they all go down. Uh, so, so that allows people, that very simple rule allows the shy person at the back that doesn't think they can ski terribly well uh, to actually say, I'm really uncomfortable. Uh, so I, I like that very simple explanation of how um, uh, they're, in, they're, they're doing little things to build psychological safety in, 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 a, in, in a, you know, an uncertain, dangerous environment. And you quote Peter, there's a Peter Drucker quote in your piece about a person can perform only from strength. And the emphasis well, of your work is, is, is about developing those personal strengths to create organisational strength. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so I suggest the starting point in building resilient leadership is to effectively do a little audit of, you know, what is my resilient strength? How well do I cope with crisis? And um, I, 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 I kind of went to um, Jared Diamond for uh, um, some, some, some advice on this in his latest book, Upheaval, How Nations Cope with Crisis and Change. He describes 12 factors which crisis therapists um, uh, according to crisis therapists, make it more or less likely that a person will deal with um, and, and be successful in coping with, with, uh, with, with crisis. Now he goes on to, to, to talk about how nations cope against those 12 factors, but they're relevant for all leaders. Uh, for example, Diamond says that um, of one of the factors experienced of previous personal crisis, if a person has coped successfully with a previous crisis, they will have greater confidence to cope with the next one. And that's exactly what we found in our research in, in local government too. So, so you know, there's, there's a neat kind of 12 factors that, that we could use as, as leaders to look at that and think, well, you know, um, how well am I coping on that front? How flexible am I personally? Have I done a, you know, a, a kind of proper, um, honest self-appraisal of where I'm at as far as coping with, with, with crisis? And it goes on. So I, I think that's, particularly uh, that's particularly important as a starting point in the journey so it's a question of capturing those experiences within the organizational culture to, to build resilience yeah and uh, and you know i, I think I, I think within the organizational culture then there's issues of psychological safety of course which can make it easier or easier or more difficult uh, to, to be able to build that resilience. But there's other practical things that, that can happen, I think, like, um, you know, creating a flexible and adaptable workforce, uh, thinking, well, how can we more, more easily redeploy people? Um, are we recruiting people in for individual skills when actually we should be recruiting for a learning mindset? Uh, and are we building the skills of your curiosity and creativity and just tapping into what Chris was talking about a, a little earlier on about being uncomfortable with discomfort. You know, for me, that's the cure, increasing curiosity bandwidth, especially on deprivation sensitivity, so we can feel, you know, appreciate that we need to feel uncomfortable. So I, I think the greater the psychological safety in the organization, uh, you know, th then we have a greater chance as well of being able to create flexibility and adaptability. Thank you, Susie. Your mention of uh, learning leads me perfectly on to our, our final guest this afternoon, who is Carsten Linz. Uh, Carsten's contribution to the book was why learning organisations are, re are resilient. So Carsten puts learning centre stage in the creation of resilience. Carsten, uh, welcome. And it, uh, let's, let me pick out some important things that I kind of saw in, in your article. First one was treating resilience as a means rather than an outcome. Can, can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to, pro to contribute to the book, first of all, and now sharing a bit of the thoughts behind you know, uh, the contribution. 
Um, I mean, let's put ourselves into the shoes of a leader. So we see a world of nested crisis. Uh, we, if you look at the economic uncertainty index, which is constantly above 300. So we live in a world where the severity, the frequency of changes and the persistence of these unnormal crisis situation is steadily increasing. So uh, this leads us, of course, to the topic of resilience. But what does that now mean for a leader? It, many leaders we're working with, Susie is working with me, it's now, now I have to work on resilience, right? That's a natural, you know, you know, now I have to work on resilience, I have to do something with resilience. But then easily we can misinterpret that and mean, you know, resilience is a mean, but resilience is the outcome. It's, it's a bit like agility, you know, that I'm very much into leveraging digital technology for the sake of driving business or social impact at scale. And agility has the same connotation. Agility is an outcome, but you can only reach it over a certain period of time, a longer journey, when you basically apply relatively rigid principles. And this leads to agility, it's counterintuitive. And the same holds true for resilience we we're talking uh, today about. It's, it's, the question is, you know, what are the means to drive that? but not to misunderstand resilience uh, as a means, because this has quite a downside. And we, 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 we love to talk about resilience in a positive way. You know, it's, it's the meter competence of, of, the, of the day. Everyone is, is longing for resilience. But what's, what does it mean? If, if we treat resilience as means, we can easily end up with toughness. So, so, and that has two downsides, you know, from an individual perspective, it means like we, we're much too tolerant for, uh, for adversity. So we're staying too long in a toxic environment as, as an employee, for example, with the boss that you don't want to have or for an organization. We, we're stretching organization beyond what is really uh, feasible, what is really, really doable. We're burning out organizations. So for once again, if you treat um, resilience as the mean, you run into substantial risk of reducing both leadership, but also organizational effectiveness. And this is why I would strongly uh, argue that resilience must be an outcome to be regarded as an outcome that we can reach after a certain period of time after going through a journey. And uh, I, I would suggest four elements that we could use as a means to reach this outcome of resilience. The first one is exactly to your point, you already said during the introduction, it's about leading and learning uh, with an infinite mindset. So it, it, it's really like treating business uh, as it is an infinite game and not a finite game. So not focusing on competition, not saying, you know, uh, I want a benchmark because you never get be better than the benchmark. If you over, overly focus on, on your competition, you defocus innovation for your customers. I think Jeff Bezos said that wonderfully all the day. So, but if we treat it, think in the long term, think business, treat it as, as it is, it's an infinite game. It's not a finite game. The, the, the idea is to stay in the game. Then we have a very good mental model to, to as a lever one, to, to drive resilience forward. The second one, I think it's think in terms of strategic options. So, so during my PhD thesis, I really looked into the concept of real options. So kind of building um, flexibility, building flexibility, strategic options by hatching a portfolio of strategic options or so real options. And the good thing is there is an asymmetry. On the one side, you basically can um, uh, create profits, but, but at the same time, uh, you're, you're also basically reducing the losses. But as you don't have to execute these flexibility options, you have an asymmetry. So you're ending up in a better shape if you're basically hatching your portfolio right. Nevertheless, you should not have too many of these flexibility options because they mean organizational slack, so to speak, uh, because otherwise you're running out of resources sooner or later. So there's also a trick to hatch not too many of these strategic option bets. Then we looked uh, very much along the lines of our book, Radical Business Model Transformation, into the option of transforming into more resilient business models. And a clear outcome of our research is if the more you move into what we call inclusive business models, be platform business models, orchestrating digital ecosystem, be a solution or outcome-based business model, they add up and they pay towards the goal of building resilience. And last but not least, 
and we, we feel like if we want to basically drive our organization towards the goal of you know also sensing organizations which is an important prerequisite of, of reaching this outcome of resilience then digital means can help quite sub substantially if we leverage artificial intelligence for example graph-based networks this does not only apply to sensing organization along the supply chain where i think it's more state of the art already today but if we extend that and basically we build a sensing organization um, in, in, in all aspects of the value chain or network, I think we have four levers to, which help us to drive and hopefully reach this ultimate goal. I would say it's, it's the goal that we're aiming for of resilience. So kind of in a nutshell, I would say we have to look at the means that drive us to uh, resilience, but we should not basically mix it up and say resilience is a means, but it's an outcome. And this is why learning organizations is so pivotal. At a practical level, Carsten, when, when you go when you go into organizations and talk to them, what, what are the things you, you you advise them to start doing to build their resist, re, re, resilience? What can organizations start doing at a very practical level to build build their re, resilience? Mm -hmm. uh, from a business model and an operation model perspective, it's quite easy because typically organizations run their business uh, models as a portfolio of business models. So in, 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 in few cases, you really have one business model which uh, the entire organization follows. So fundamentally, you're managing a portfolio of business model, business model types. And we would suggest that you know you have a certain level of your, of your business models which are more resilient than others. And we have clearly laid out which are those. And platforms and solution outcome-based business models, definitely with their recurring revenue streams, uh, with their stickiness in the customer engagement, they are, have been proven or they've proven to be also during the COVID-19 crisis more resilient. We've seen that. So shifting your business model strategically, your business model portfolio, sorry, strategic towards more of these inclusive business models definitely pays uh, towards the goal of reaching more resilient, um, more resilience in your organization. In the uh, operations models, that's interesting. I mean, we all apply already today what is really good for resilience. I mean, in a crisis mode, I mean, we do everything perfectly. We say, you know, we have a small team, you know, they're well networked in the organization, they're executive leaders, you know, they can make decisions. We do everything right. Unfortunately, this is not feasible in the long term. It's, it's not doable because you overcommit for a crisis situation, but it's not a sustainable approach. But if you now bring in digital technologies and basically have sensing with the help of AI, sensing operating models, you can basically take the idea of such a crisis model with a small central team and basically embed it and make it an integral part uh, of your operating model of the organization. So these are two examples of what you could do specifically. Thanks, thanks, Carsten. So please send in your questions uh, for our four uh, experts we have gathered together today. Um, we've got a question from Ferd Ferdinando. Uh, how can we measure resilience in an organization? Uh, Chris, would you like to have a go with that? Is it a good idea to measure resilience? Can you measure resilience? I don't know, uh, is, my, is my question. Uh, no, that's my answer. Um, my answer is I don't know. Um, you know, there's certainly narrow places where, um, like I think of my background in finance, right? I mean, there was a, a movement after the financial crisis to make less bad assumptions about how bank balance sheet and assets would respond to shocks and do a better job of, of kind of modeling that. And so that, that's, that's sort of a way of, of maybe modeling resilience, but that's also just such a narrow slice of things. Um, you know, when we, when we wrote Meltdown, Andras uh, Tilchik, who's my co-author and I, we really decided very explicitly not to take a kind of quantitative measurement based approach because part of the nature of complexity is that um, you know it's it the whole point of it is that it's in the details and that you can never know all the details and so part of me wonders if if resilience is the is the same thing here I mean to build off what what Carson said a moment ago I mean in a sense the organization's 
results, what it's doing every day over the long term, I mean, that's the ultimate measure of resiliency in some sense. Um, but I don't know if that's if that's satisfying for for Ferdinando, because it's kind of I just elaborated on I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's the, that's the difficulty with resilience, isn't it? That you you want to you want to know that you're you're seven out of ten on some resilience quotient, and therefore you're reassured about the future. But I think uh, Gudrun's point from her work at Reykjavik Energy is that it's got to be it, it's dynamic and ha happening all the time. There's no there's no single measure. Uh, Good Gudrun, uh, did I represent your views accurately there? It, it, is a, is a measure of um, resilience useful or possible? Um, I would think that no, it's not uh, feasible to have some kind of uh, measurement for resilience because it's so uh, it's on many levels. Uh, like we've been going through here, uh, we have leadership resilience, we have organizational resilience, etc. So I think that if you're going to measure it, you're going to have to have a lot of measurements measuring different things. So I, I don't think that a quantitative uh, measurement is, no, not feasible. Uh, Sagan has made, made a point. Could there be a way to understand where an organization is on the journey? And that, that seems to me a, uh, a more realistic take on it instead of a, a definitive measure you've got some sense of of where you are in in make in making sense of these issues i mean it goes back again to the question is it a means or is it uh, basically an outcome and uh, so the question initially asks is the question about an outcome kpi or okr uh, which i would say is, is quite difficult as uh, also the other panelists said i think uh, basically measuring progress on the way towards this ultimate goal of resilience i think is more feasible so so kind of what is your percentage of uh, recurring revenue um, uh, streams uh, in, in your portfolio of business model, for example, you know, um, are you hatching strategic bets? Are you building uh, R&D partnerships? Um, I think it's something at least you can quantify, uh, qualitatively assess and, and, and help also the organization to guide it in the right direction, because ultimately we still remember the days where we said organizational slack is a bad thing. Uh, you know, just think about this statement in the context of resilience. It's just wrong, right? You will never get towards resilience if we say uh, organization slack is a big thing. But we had a time where it said, you know, there should not be any organization slack in an organization because we're super 100% efficiency driven. So I think just having an indication what is right, what is wrong, I think gives, uh, gives good uh, guidance to an organization and in times of extreme uncertainty in terms of nested crisis. I think this guidance is, is definitely needed from my perspective. I, yeah, and just I think, to, yeah, sorry. help yourself, Susie. Yeah, no, I, I think just, just, um, just adding to that um, about measuring on the journey, I think it would be possible to create some indicators that would, and there would be indicators that would let you, um, let you into understanding, you know, how, how resilient the organization was and where it could move towards. And there might be soft behavior indicators. You know, if you, if you look at people, you might have some measure of the extent to which you feel your workforce is adaptable and flexible. You might have some indication as to how clear the organization is directionally and with purpose. Um, you know, it might be other simple indicators around how leaders are behaving. Um, you, know, uh, you know, are they looking after themselves? Um, you know, it, 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 are there strong networks happening within the organization? Are teams functioning well? Or is there total burnout? Some of these things, I think it would be possible. I'm also inclined towards the Jared Diamond approach of, you know, as the, what he's done is, is look at the what crisis um, therapists say, um, or the factors that, that influence, of course, an individual's ability to cope with, with stress, but and then has applied that to nations. So, you know, in the same way that he's applied that concept to nations, you could apply the same to organizations, I'd say. I want to I want to throw my lot in with with Susie there and just say I'm, I'm kind of with you when I think about it. It's like I'm thinking about, you know, 
oh, is it, are you in a psychologically safe organization? Is it an organization that provides support to its leaders and its leadership team? I mean, do, do leaders have coaches? Do leader, you know, I mean, all of these things are, are, are they taught to, you know, be curious? Are they, are they, is, is curiosity and questioning supported or is it squashed? So I think there's this whole, um, it's almost like a, it, if you, if, if, if you want to think about resilience, I think the way to do it is to focus on the process, the kind of the super superstructure, um, rather than sort of thinking that you're going to be able to measure, you know, the outcome of resilience, because even, even that it's like, well, what are you resilient to? What kind yeah. of shocks are you resilient to? But, but I like, I really like where you're going. And I, I, I think I share your sort of human uh, centered focus on, on that. Like, how are people behaving? I, uh, I think we need to get together, Chris. <laughs> Create a tool. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you to Charles Sommerin for his com comment. He, he, Charles says, in a VUCA world, the dynamics of resilience is an out outcome of human behavior. I think it's an outcome of existential trust inherent in organizations. Without it, no resilience can occur. I think we're coming to an agreement with that. Or am I wrong, Chris? I, it's, I'm ha I just have a little trouble just parsing it. And I think it's probably just me. Um, I guess I'm not quite sure what the existential trust uh, bit means. But um, I think the idea that there are certainly kind of human behavioral prerequisites to building a resilient, adaptable system uh, is, is part of things. Yes, S Sagun says maybe we need a resilience maturity guide or model, something that's not overly prescriptive. G Gudrun, that sounds a little bit like what, you, what you're trying to achieve. Yes, it definitely it sounds like uh, that this question is actually uh, related uh, to the book chapter that I wrote. And uh, I do think that uh, trust, I agree, I don't exactly understand the existential trust, or is it just the level of trust within the organization that exists at that point in time? Uh, but I think, uh, yes, the resilience is an outcome of human behavior. And like Susie was talking about, uh, you need, uh, yes, strong leadership, but uh, are, you, uh, are you working with uh, the employees? Are you working with the leaders? Are you, do they have uh, some mentors? Do they have someone coaching them, et cetera? So yes, and yes, trust is uh, very important, but it's never inherent in organizations. Trust is not, uh, it's not a constant. <laughs> And it's also, that's, yeah, we are unable to measure trust. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and the constancy thing is, is an interesting element in, I think it goes back to what uh, Susie said something about um, uh, capturing people's experience and knowledge because uh, people leave organizations. And so how does that impact the resilience in, in, in integral to an organization? Uh, there's a comment from somebody in, in the Q&A box. What, what could be some of the possible leading and lagging indicators related to organizational resilience? Uh, Carsten, I think you've, you've kind of talked about that to some extent. Yeah, uh, before that, if, if I may, I can, because it, my brain is ticking. So with the trust thing, uh, I'm struggling with that a bit, to be honest, <laughs> potentially I'm the only one, because uh, I mean, it, for, for me, if you have psychological safety, you have a very good foundation to build a, a resilient organization, also learning organization, which which the point I tried to make earlier, trust and especially essential ex ex existential trust for me sometimes has this connotation of being, you know, a family, we all trust each other, we're all together in this and so on. This sometimes is stands in the way of really having contradict contradictory views and viewpoints. Uh, and this is definitely negative uh, for building a resilient organization. An organization, an organization that is resilient uh, basically is really good in dealing with the contradiction. It's just the opposite. So when the existential, especially underlining the existential trust stands in the way of dealing with contradictions, then I would not agree. 
So this is just a kind of food for thought for, now you asked about kind of uh, leading and letting indicators. Now I have the easy question, right? Uh, I mean, I tried working on that, or I know I tried elaborating a bit on that. I mean, it's, I mean, I, I would always say, you know, on, on the personal level, I think uh, what Susie said, I, I would, would fully subscribe. I think we can extend on that a bit in, in, in more dimensions. On the organizational uh, level, I think it's slightly different. Uh, from my perspective, it's very much going into the dimension of, you know, making sure the organization is learning that has something to do with this failure culture thing, so not focusing on the failure. So it's, it's really not failing fast, failing forward. What we always thought is really about learning fast. So the winning organizations are learning fast as a, as a core and meta competence um, and, and how to basically uh, bake that into OKRs or KPIs, uh, leading and lagging indicators, and leave that, other, leave that to others. Uh, same with the, with the business models where I started to elaborate a bit on the you know, portions of the revenue coming from recovering revenue streams, for example. I think that might be even a leading indicator, not only a lagging one. I think we have to th think that through more thoroughly, but I would assume potentially it's a good opportunity for the next book. I don't know. Uh, that might be something to, to further elaborate on because the collective wisdom of this group, I think, should be able to bake something together. Uh, Hadja makes a point. Should we focus on organizational culture to assure, assure a organizational resilience? And I, I, I think we're in, we're in agreement with that, aren't we? Susie? You're, up, you're on mute, Susie. Most most popular words in the last two years, right? <laughs> Wait, you double clicked. You're back on mute. Oh, <laughs> sorry, <Chris. laughs> I'll, I'll say this quickly in case I mute myself again. Um, it's true. I was looking at the Q and A from Sagan as you were just talking. Can you repeat the question again? Uh, should we focus on organizational culture to to, to uh, assure ourselves of organizational resilience? Uh, one and the I, same? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. So the organization culture will enable the organization to be resilient or otherwise. You know, I, I, I could, you know, I'm thinking about an organization culture, which, um, you know, is extremely supportive, helps people to reflect on how well they're coping with uh, particular challenges, you know, organization culture that um, for example, you know, does a team diagnostic to understand the extent to which the conditions are available for the team to be a high performing team and then invest in that. You know, all of those things will certainly make, back to the kind of measures thing, that's going to make an organization more resilient versus the organization which, um, you know, has people working from eight in the morning till three and four in the morning, sometimes I have a daughter in investment banking. <laughs> you know, and you don't wonder, you know, how, how much resilience is there if people are working in that way. So culture and resilience, I think culture drives the, the resilience and probably some vice versa. Uh, Michael McKenna makes a point. Isn't resiliency boiled down to the organization's ability to continuously monitor and assess PESL? and other external internal factors, which will trigger trigger changes to the defined strategy and key objectives. Too often oh. organizations don't treat changes or trends as impactful to the current outcomes. This I, is I, the I, I, organization. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm just gonna jump in because uh, that's kind of going back to the question about the ski guide, you know, in the same way that the guys prepare, they'll track the conditions to be able to assess what the other launch risk is gonna be later in the season. Um, and in the same way, certainly one of my recommendations is that people should be conducting doing a pest and scenario analysis, just knowing what's coming up at them. Um, but I think it's not just doing it, it's the way they do it. If you do it with all stakeholders and with diverse thinking styles, you're going to be much uh, in a much better place to plan and prepare for what's coming at you. So I agree very much. Thank you with that. Yeah. But we're, we're I, I want to... I just want to I want to add something to that because I think that, um, and I think about this a lot in my work. Like leaders, and I'm aware of the time, Stuart, so I'll keep this short. I, I think leaders in general are undersupported in their ability to say I don't know. They're undersupported in their ability to lead with curiosity, um, and I think there's a 
there's a real need for that. There's a real need for organizations to embrace the the not knowing is fascinating, right? There's a real a, a real need for for organizations to embrace that and to support their leaders in being able to break, embrace that kind of all all up and down the the line. We're running out of time, so it'd be good to get a final word from you from you all about what you what people really need to understand about the resilience. What 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 do people misunderstand? What what do they really need to know in just a, in in a few lines? Now, Carsten. Yeah, treat resilience as an outcome, not as a means. And I think along the lines of what we just discussed, it's really a, along the lines of the idea of heckle uh, in the 80s, but now the digital capabilities are in place to achieve that, build an organization which is sensing, responding, adapting. Uh, and then I think we're on a good journey towards a more resilient organization. Uh, good, Gudrun, what, what, do, what do people need to understand about resilience, do you think? Uh, I think it's a little bit like we have mentioned before. I think it's the culture, uh, and that includes uh, leadership. So I think that should be uh, a strong focus. And Susie, final word? Yeah, building on that, I think people should, individuals should remember that they can um, strengthen their own resilience as a starting point. And Chris, you get the final word. You can quote from Keats if you want. Uh, <laughs> What should, what should people take away about resilience? Well, I, I guess I'd like to say that um, I think if, if you want to start in a place, curiosity is a great place to start. Um, and it's one of my favorite parts of my work, which is, you know, teaching leaders and working with leaders to support them as, as they shift from this answers mindset to a curiosity mindset. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Goodrun. Uh, thank you, Susie. Thank you, Carsten. Really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, the four contributors are all contributors to the new book from Brightline and Thinkers50 called Building Resilient Organizations. It doesn't provide every single answer you need to know about resilience, but it provides a kind of smorgasbord of inspiration, practice, and great ideas to start you thinking about resilience. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, a final word to you, Tyru. Yeah, thank you so much, Stuart, and uh, thank you all for a great session that we just had. I mean, it was amazing hearing from you. And uh, thank you also to attendees who shared questions and comment and so on. Uh, what we, we, we're getting there is resilience really doesn't happen overnight, so it will require strategizing. Resilience actually in the face of uh, challenges, organization may have to reimagine. Organ organization will have to go through crisis and understanding how to withstand the crisis. And we heard culture, leadership, people, I mean, the notion of curiosity coming in. And what I will add is the numbers though are very dire, like uh, about 70% of transformations are still failing. You know, and, and, and we know we cannot rest on our laurels. We cannot just leave it and just stay st stand still. And that's why PMI uh, for Brightline uh, will continue to bring to the forefront, uh, I mean, cutting, cutting edge insights, as well as sharing best practices as well. And as we go through transformations, really, it is, uh, and it's became perpetual. It is our hope, really our hope that the insight that are in the book and the generosity that we got from many of the contributors, the people will be able to take them and be able to apply them and be able to create organizations that are delivering value and organizations that are resilient. So uh, thank you so much for that. And uh, I, I want to also reinforce that you can secure a copy of uh, the book for the link we provided. Uh, the book is available in PMI Bookstore. It is also available on Amazon and uh, Barnes and & Nobles. And uh, they'll be also available in both, both uh, digital and uh, uh, hard copies as well. So uh, please uh, stay tuned, stay tuned, because we'll continue to bring more sessions uh, to you uh, through the Brighton uh, Transformation Talks. Uh, until then, uh, until next time. Yeah, really appreciate it. Have a great one.